Welcome to this episode of Dishing Dirt. Today we're going to meet with Michael Dickey and learn about his cattle and sheep operation and how he has a unique twist to what he does at his farm. So let's dig in. Hey, Cammie, welcome to the uh, M&K Farms. Very good. Thanks so much for having us here to go check out your farm and what you have going on. Okay, well, let's jump in the mule and let's go t uh, take a look at the sheep and the cattle. Fabulous. being with us today. Tell us a little bit about your farming operation where we are today. Well we are uh, McGinney Town, Arkansas and we have a cattle and a sheep operation. We run about 70 uh, mama cows and we have about 85 ewes. Uh, they're Katahdin sheep, they're hair sheep. Uh, we try to lamb once a year but this year we're going to try it uh, twice due to some predator problems we had earlier this year. Very good. Okay so for our viewers what's a ewe? A ewe is a female uh, uh, sheep that has had uh, lambs. Very good. So with those 85 ewes, how many lambs do you usually have in a year? Well, what we try to do is have between 100 and 150 uh, percent crop. Um, so if they, tw if they twin out like we're hoping, uh, with 85 that'd be we're hoping around 160. Awesome. Probably not going to get 160, so it may be, you know, it, it, somewhere in between 100% and 150 is what we're, we're shooting for, so 160. So if we have around 100 to 125, uh, we're doing good. That's awesome. So most ewes will have two babies two. every time they two. say we birth. Yes, they'll have two. Sometimes they'll have triplets. Uh, usually a, a, a young ewe uh, will only have one her first year, her first time. Very good. So what time of year do you usually lay them out? I, I usually try in the springtime. Uh, and like I said, this year we're trying to have two sets because we lost so many uh, uh, lambs to predators. So we're, we're going to try two uh, this year and they should start lambing and probably the next week. And it's uh, probably the first of November is when they'll start lambing. So once they have their, their babies, then do you keep those out here or do you bring them into a barn or how does that work? Usually they will lamb out on the on the uh, acreage, and uh, usually they'll they'll raise them right here. Very good. Sometimes we'll move them up if we feel like there's uh, more predator problems, uh, but usually they'll stay right out here on, on the on the property. And when we came up, there were three dogs. So tell us a little bit about how the dogs help in your operation. We have uh, two female and one male. The two female are sisters, and they are an Anatolian uh, Akbosh cross. And the male is a Merima Akbosh cross. Awesome. And they help with predator control. Uh, anything that will come out here, coyote or bobcat, uh, they will they will take oh, them out. Yeah. Them. yeah, they will Very move them good. out. And uh, last year, 
we only had the one male dog and uh, it just wasn't enough for the sheep that we had. Usually they say that you need uh, two dogs per 50 head and every 50 after that you need another dog. So uh, we're, we're wanting to continue to grow. Uh, I'd like to have anywhere from 100 to 150 ewes in the next couple of years. And uh, so we've already got the dog fire ready Very for the cows. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ashley Mann, and I would like for you to join me on my show, Breathe Yoga, on Channel 5. Each episode will consist of a 30-minute yoga practice that will help you along your yoga journey, whether you are new to yoga or an advanced practitioner. So if you've always wanted to try yoga but didn't know where to begin, join me on Breathe Yoga, only on Channel 5. Fitness is about so much more than exercise. It's a catalyst for positive change and it affects every aspect of your life. Conway Regional Health and Fitness Center is your source for comprehensive medical-based health and fitness programs. Dedicated to improving the wellness of those within our community, we offer something for everyone in the family. Conway Regional Health and Fitness Center, over 20 years of health and wellness in our community. So there's, nice. there's different worms for for different for uh, different livestock, you know, and both of them will help help each other out on that aspect. So do they eat anything besides just the grass? Do you have to give them any supplements or any of that? We do give them minerals and salt at times, uh, and they they do need copper. People say, well, you don't feed copper to sheep. Well, they they're like people, you know, they do need every vitamin mineral out there you just have to be aware that they don't need to overdose on it i guess you could yes. say so well very yeah. good so not only do you have to help the, with their you know raising them you're also having to do a lot with your pastures where you're talking to us about co-grazing where yeah. you're raising more than one animal in an area rotational grazing where you're moving them from like station to station paddock to paddock but what do you have to do to get the grass and everything to grow in the different paddocks you talked about you can use the sheep for weed control, but are you also almost having to be a grass farmer? Actually, it goes even deeper than that. I'm a soil producer or a soil uh, person because it starts in the soil, goes to the grass, goes to the cattle. So, you know, at first I always thought of myself as, well, I'm a livestock producer. Well, I'm more than that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grass farmer. Well, I'm even more than that. I'm a soil builder. You know, because all those uh, need each other, you know, to, to, to work. And uh, so one of the things we, we try to do and is to grow the grass tall enough that, you know, it keeps cover on, on the soil. Uh, and right now it's kind of short because we just got through bush hogging for the sage grass. But we try to uh, go through our pastures and take half, leave half. That's, that's kind of my mentality on it. Uh, if it's 20 inches, I only take it down to the 10 inches. And if it's 30 inches, I try to take it down to 15 in inches because if you heat up this soil from the sunlight and it bakes it, 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 it kills a lot of your, your earthworms and dung beetles and insects that are helping you to build that soil. So as a livestock producer, you're almost like an uber conservationist <laughs> yes. because you're having to make sure that you maintain the grass and right. that, or the soil and that maintains the grass and you have something to feed your animals right. with. And sometimes people come out here and they're like, boy, you've got a lot of weeds. Well, I want the weeds. Um, you know, it's a different mindset from what a lot of people think is a pretty farm because I need weeds to, to feed my cat, my sheep. Right. You know? And uh, without those weeds, because sheep don't care too much for bunny grass. They don't like, they'll eat it, but they really don't care for the bahia grass either. And that's what this primarily is, is Bermuda and, and uh, 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 bahia and we, of course we do have a lot of uh, native grasses also. So instead of that manicured where some of our producers in the county are really great to have a pure Bermuda grass right. where they are doing that for hay production. Right. That would that would be this is more that's a manicured golf course yes. and you have a more natural park right. natural park atmosphere yeah. where you're getting to feed all of the animals. I don't want a monoculture I want multiple uh, grasses out there uh, they grow at different times. Uh, some can tolerate the heat more than others, you know, so it's good to have different grasses out there for your livestock. Um, and it's, sheep and, and cattle are a lot like 
humans. You know, we don't want lobster every night. We don't want a steak every night. You know, I mean, that'd get old pretty quick, and that's the way they are. And if you really watch them, they, they may take a, a bite of this and a bite of that, you know, and mix it all together, and uh, that's, that's what they like, you know, and that's the way people are too. Tell us um, about, you talked about rotational grazing. Tell us a little bit about that and what you had to do. Well, when I got this property, there wasn't very many fences or cross fences on it, and you really want to control and manage uh, the cattle and where they graze. And the biggest, uh, the biggest thing for, for your grass is giving it time to rest. And right now, uh, or this past year, all these pastures had about between 35 and 40 days of rest. Okay. And what happens is that grass, people don't understand how grass works. A lot of people don't. Well, when your grass is this tall above the soil, that's how long the roots are. Every time that cow or sheep eats that grass and it shortens it, those roots shrink. So if you have real short grass, you have real short roots. And when you have real short roots and a drought comes, you, roots, have, no you have no grass because the roots can't go down far enough to tap into the water. And so that's another reason why you want to keep the grass tall in the grow, growing season to, to capture that water. Also, it keeps the soil cool so you don't have near as much moisture. Another thing about the grass when it's tall is it captures all the water. The water sinks down and doesn't run off. So you have the water right there. Very good. Yeah, it goes across the road also. Okay. So now, on your cattle, when do they usually have baby calves? That's what I'd like to have, but I do have some that meet that requirement. Yeah. It's because my dad started buying cattle and they were having cattle. Oh, look at that one. <laughs> you can see how much manure they, they uh, crap right here in this one small area. And the manure is worth about 300 to 400 uh, pounds of nitrogen, and the urine is about a thousand, is what they say. And so what we're doing is we're building organic uh, in the soil, and the organic is what keeps your moisture in the ground. So that's what we're that's what we're shooting for. So more manure we have, better off. Uh, with the rotational grazing, they don't go to their favorite tree and sit there and, and deposit all their manure and urine right there. They're out on the pasture. Putting it evenly distributed. Evenly distributed. They say it takes about 30 years to, to distribute if you were conventionally grazing. It only takes about three if you're rotational grazing. So that's a huge difference. Yeah. You're, you're building Especially soil when pasture. you're doing your soil farming. And... Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move some cows. Okay. So then... Your goal is to do this strip grazing so that you can have grass for them to eat longer into the winter, yeah. meaning that you wouldn't have to feed hay like other producers right. that are just doing traditional grazing. I got tickled because uh, my dad goes to the coffee shop and uh, several people kept asking, when y'all gonna cut that for hay? Y'all need to cut that for hay. Why are you not cutting that for hay? And I, I said, did you explain to them about strip grazing? And they said, no, because they wouldn't understand. <laughs> and uh, so, but yeah, that's that's the goal is to not have to, to uh, you know, time you cut it, rake it, bailed it, take the hay off the ground, and then bring the hay back. That's, that's a lot of work, uh, a lot of diesel that you're spending, uh, you know, more wear and tear on your tractor. There's nothing more efficient than a cow. You know, if you cut hay, you're going to lose a lot, leave a lot of hay on the ground. You know, then you have the hay at the barn, and you know a lot of people have it on the outside, so you got spoilage. You're not going to spoil this. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Dishing Dirt. We want to thank Michael Dickey and his family for giving us a tour of their farm. See you next time.